All right, I think we are live. Okay, uh, been another long day here in Kiev, and um, I just wanted to. Uh, we have been uh, advised that the city of Kiev is now surrounded and um, cut off by the Russians. And, you know, all of the Exville routes have been closed. And, and I'm in, in Kiev. I'm, I'm about six kilometers from the center of town here. I can see the uh, giant statue of the World War II lady with the sword and everything from, where I'm in my, from my hotel window. Um, We've been watching the fighting going on throughout the day, watching the Russians advancing, uh, seeing combat coming down from the north, from the northeast, and all the way around to the southwest. Uh, I, I believe there still is a route open to the south. And even if it's not a major route, there are hundreds of little back roads and stuff, that, and there's no way they could close them all off. Uh, sounds like the mic is rubbing on something. Thank you for knowing that. That's bad. Tell me if that's better. Is that better? Hello? Is that better? It looks good to me. Let's put this on the outside. Maybe the mic is better. Okay, that's better. Uh, so, anyway, what I was saying is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the mayor of Kiev is saying that the city is surrounded. And uh, we're in the city, so that's kind of a bad thing. It's what we've been trying to avoid all this time. Uh, we have been trying to gauge, you know, how long we can stay uh, without getting encircled by the Russians. If we get picked up by the Russians, that's going to be a pretty bad thing. Uh, I may end up staying here for several months, <laughs> if not more. I don't want to run my, my empire from Siberia. So I have no intention of getting picked up by the Russians. They probably won't, wouldn't be too nice. I mean, they're not going to execute you, but they're, they're probably not going to be very nice to you if, you get, if they find out you're an American journalist. Um, so the question is, what do we do? What do we do from here? And we've made some plans. I'm not going to get into sharing everything we're going to do, but the, the bottom line is that I've tried to identify where that circle is uh, of troops coming around Kiev, and we're going to try to get outside that circle. Uh, now, we really wanted to stay. I, I, I'd love to stay here, but the kind of journalism that I'm doing with Newsmax is uh, live broadcasts every hour on the hour, uh, setting up against a backdrop, and usually it, it's at nighttime here, so uh, you don't really get to show much in your backdrop. And that's a, that's a problem. Um, so it, it's not going to matter if we're in key, inside the city limits of Kiev or just outside the city limits of Kiev. Now, there is an oil refinery that was hit last night that's burning uh, to the southeast, uh, southwest of us. And I think that might actually make some good uh, images if we can get over on the other side of that and outside of that, because that, that's where the line of contact is right now. And there's some heavy fighting there around that oil refinery, I understand. We're hearing a lot of small arms and explosions and stuff. There. It's hard to even tell where they're coming from now because they're, they're just all around us. Uh, and as you can see, I'm in this nice hotel, the, you know, out here, 17th floor. I can have a great view of Kiev and having a glass of wine. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not uncomfortable. We're not miserable. I'm not sleeping in a foxhole anywhere. Uh, if I was doing my kind of journalism, I probably would be, but this isn't really my kind of journalism. Uh, we're doing these live broadcasts from Kiev, and that's fine. That's what they're paying me to do, and I'll do my best at it, but it's not really my forte. It's not what I'm, what I'm best at. So um, anyway, long and the short of it is we are probably going to withdraw a little bit tomorrow and try to get outside the line of contact and uh, get closer to an eventual uh, border that we would cross someplace. 
There are about five different countries to choose from right now. You've got Moldova in the southeast, and then going around to the to the west, you've got Romania, and then you've got Slovakia, and then you've got Hungary, or maybe the other way around, and then Poland. Uh, once you get to Poland, any further north than that, you're into Belarus. So uh, those are our choices right now, and we're trying to decide what would be the best place. Um, do you think an all-out siege is a realistic possibility? That's exactly what they're going for. Luke, they are, they are going for an all-out siege of Kiev, and they want to starve it out and take it. Um, so the Russians are encircling Kiev. They have not been bombarding downtown Kiev, throwing you know mortars or artillery or uh, aircraft in there, uh, dropping bombs or anything. And I think that's because, I mean, there's so much incredible architecture and history and everything. Uh, as bad as they, as Russia has it in the world media, and, and you know, it's become a pariah, really, uh, among world countries. It would be 10 times worse if they destroy the beautiful monasteries and churches and, and monuments that are all over in, um, in, in Kiev. So I wonder, I kind of, thank you, Janice. That's nice of you to drop money in the tip jar. I'm always kind of surprised when people do that. I, I forget that that's an option. You can tip me in <laughs> through YouTube, I guess. There's a, a, an applaud button or something like that you can hit and actually donate a, a little money. And I will try to take that money and use it to help some of these refugees. We've already had people send me over $1,000 and just, you know, uh, some money that they want. They say, just help somebody with it. And that's one of the great things about this podcast is I can uh, actually uh, help them, help them on camera, show you where your money's going. I'm not, you know, buying a Maserati with it. Uh, we're just doing what we can to help people that are having the worst day of their lives. And there's a lot of those people out here right now. Uh, so, again, with Kiev being encircled, the idea is that they, they choke it out. Uh, they're, they're throttling Kiev right now. Because Kiev is the is the centerpiece of this conflict. If they take Kiev, they're gonna they think the rest of the country is gonna fall. I think they're gonna have partisan war until the cows come home, until the last Russian leaves Ukraine, because these Ukrainians are not going for this. They're not gonna roll over. This is not Afghanistan. And I think this shows just how cowardly the president of Afghanistan was when he jumped on a plane and left with millions of dollars. Uh, when, when, and left his country to a bunch of 7th century goat herders uh, when these people here in, in Kiev tonight are taking on the second largest military in the world and they're doing it with AK-47s that they got yesterday and they're digging foxholes and build, you know, filling sandbags and they are going to defend their city to the last man. And uh, unfortunately, too many of them have already paid the ultimate price. I don't know if you heard that, but there's uh, explosions back in the background. Probably not with this microphone, but uh, we can hear the kaboom of explosions now and then. We saw fast movers go right by our hotel today, uh, some military convoys and things like that. Uh, you know, the again, smoke on the horizon where all the fighting and stuff is going on, and some small arms fire, which had to be fairly close. Uh, a small arms fire doesn't carry as far as the explosions do, so that's... That's pretty close. I see Elon Musk offered his satellites uh, open, but I think that's sort of a pyrrhic gesture because it's more, uh, you have to have equipment that goes with Starlink to use Starlink. You can't just log into it like it's Wi-Fi and nobody here has the equipment for Starlink. So there you go. I mean, it's, you know, not much to it. Yes, I'm in Ukraine. I'm in, in, in Kiev. For those of you just joining, I am uh, uh, in the city of Kiev in the south. Uh, part of the, the city, just about six kilometers from downtown. Uh, am I able to be in a basement or bottom floor? No, I'm on the 17th floor. It's kind of hard to see the action from the basement. There is a, a bomb shelter, and they've actually called us to go to the bomb shelter twice in the last 12 hours or so. Uh, I haven't gone either time because uh, the guy that's running that show is kind of a weenie, I think. <laughs> and uh, the, he tried to send everybody to the bomb shelter when they bombed the oil refinery, which is 35 kilometers from here. You don't call people the bomb shelter for that. Uh, 35 kilometers, you know, there's nothing that has range like that. You know, no bomb in the world's got range like that except a nuclear one. So uh, I didn't go to the bomb shelter. I rolled over and went back to sleep. 
when I went down for dinner tonight, they were telling people to go to the bomb shelter again. And I kind of looked around and was like, there's nothing going on. So I actually was almost by myself in the chow hall, uh, chow hall, <laughs> uh, like in the military now, in the cafeteria, whatever they call it, uh, getting dinner. And um, yeah, there are some buildings getting hit, but they're not targeting buildings. Um, it's not like they're going, oh, there's a hotel. Let's shoot a you know, missile at that. Uh, they, they just, their precision fires are not very precise. So uh, yeah, I'm an American and I'm still here because I'm bringing reports to you of what's actually going on on the ground. That's why I'm here. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're not like, they don't have enough ammo to shoot all the buildings in, in Kiev. And they're not, like I said, doing general bombardments or anything. They're not carpet bombing Kiev or anything. They're making targeted strikes, but unfortunately their targeting systems are not very good. And so, as we saw yesterday, they sent a missile into the ninth floor of an apartment building. Uh, I'm pretty sure they didn't mean to do that. And those missiles are pretty expensive for one thing, and they were trying to take out something important. But, uh, and there's no tactical value to taking out an apartment building unless it's full of people that are shooting at you, which it wasn't. And that missile was fired from a long ways away. So well, one of the interesting things about this is we are getting a very good look at Russian morale, Russian training, Russian equipping, and it turns out it's not that great. They got a really big army, but their soldiers are not wanting to fight. They've captured hundreds and hundreds of them and what they're telling the Ukrainians is, I didn't even know uh, I, that, that I was supposed to come and invade Ukraine. They told us we were going on training exercises. And the next thing I know, I'm rolling into Ukraine with a loaded weapon. I don't want to fight the Ukrainians. Why would I do that? There's a lot of people that have been talking about the Chechens who are, um, you know, supposedly these really fierce, well, not supposedly, they are. They're very fierce fighters. They're brutal. And they're, they're extremist Muslims, and so they, they'll just kill you to kill you, um, and, and happily so. However, uh, the leader of the Chechens uh, got on TV and said, we're not going to fight the Ukrainians. We don't have anything against the Ukrainians. And so uh, there are some Chechens involved who were probably pressed into service, probably conscripted. I mean, the whole army in, in Russia is a conscript army, so the, the morale is definitely not going to be as high as a volunteer army. That's just how it works. So um, the Russians, although they have the numbers, they got a lot of troops and a lot of equipment. We got a lot of javelins. We, uh, not me, but the Ukrainians have a lot of javelins and a lot of heart. And that's the X factor that you just can't, you know, you, you can't measure that motivation and how that, uh, that patriotism and love for your country and the fact that you're fighting for your very existence. Uh, you know, this is not a, a crusade or a, a, an adventure for you. This is, I'm fighting for my family and for their future on my land. And people fight pretty hard when it comes to that. And so, they are showing themselves, even though they're a very much smaller force and um, they don't have the best training in the world either, but they are showing themselves uh, mightily against the Russians and they are wearing out their tanks. They've blown up more than, I, I think about 150 tanks maybe uh, at this point with those javelins. And um, the, 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 you know, the tanks are meant to go across country. They're meant to go across these vast wheat fields uh, and invade online, you know, that kind of thing. But they can't, they can't leave the roads because it's too warm. And so it's the, the, the tank that leaves the road gets stuck in the mud. We've seen some on, uh, with some videos of that today, where there are tanks literally all, almost up to the turret in mud that went off the road and they just had to abandon them there. The other thing we've heard is that Russians are, these Russian soldiers are so poorly uh, uh, motivated, they don't want to be here. They didn't plan to do this. It wasn't their intent to come and kill Ukrainians. And so they are sort of surreptitiously draining the tanks on their, uh, on their tanks. They're draining the, the fuel tanks on their vehicles. And then when they run out of fuel, they go, oh, out of fuel, sorry. And then they just walk away. They're not destroying that equipment. They're not, you know, like we would do. We would blow it up in place if we had to abandon it. But they're just leaving it there and walking off. 
uh, and a lot of them that are running out of, out of fuel today because the Ukrainians blew up a fuel resupply train of like 53 cars full of diesel fuel yesterday out in the east. So uh, I want to talk about the difference between acting out of weakness and acting out of strength. Am I still having some mic problems? Is it, is it scratchy? This mic is bugging me. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Somebody give me a somebody give me a comment if my mic is scratchy. I had a problem with that. I sound great. Okay, thank you, Janice. Uh, okay, what I was getting to is I talk about acting out of weakness and acting out of strength. If you look at everything Vladimir Putin has done in this conflict and really break it down. Vladimir Putin has acted out of weakness every time. Every decision he's made has been made out of weakness. Let me explain what I mean by that. So first of all, invading a country that isn't yours, uh, you know, acting like the jilted ex-boyfriend, you know, I still love you, Jessica. You, you know, that's kind of that, that's kind of what Putin is doing. He's he's acting like well, we broke up, but uh, I, I still love you, and so you can't date anybody else. And if you're not going to love me, then I'm going to force you to love me. And, and everybody knows how that goes in a in a relationship. In this case, uh, it, you know, it, it this kind of domestic violence involves tanks and missiles, but but it it's a very similar thing. When he's so insecure about his own country, and I would say probably about his old own manhood, and and that he, he feels the need to go invade a country. I mean, somehow he's able to convince himself that he's got the moral high ground in this. Give me a break. The Ukrainians have every ounce of moral high ground that there is to be had in this conflict. It's not even a he said, she said kind of thing. It's not even like, well, they did this to us, and so we're going to do that to them, and then we're going to keep escalating. It's not like that. Ukraine has never attacked Russia. Ukraine is just minding its own business. The fact that the people in, they, in, in Ukraine are, want to identify more with the freedom that the West has, uh, well, okay, Vladimir Putin, that's not a threat to you necessarily unless you're just afraid of your own people seeing what it's like to have a free country living next door, and they're going to want some of that freedom for themselves, and you and your cronies are going to lose your grip on power. That's more likely. Because, so that's acting out of his weakness. We also see just today that he has asked Belarus to come and, and, and join them in combat here. Well, that's acting out of weakness because it, obviously if he could take care of the problem himself, he wouldn't need the Belarusians to do it. But they're saying that, the Bel that Belarus may very well attack tonight. They're holding talks on the border tonight with President Zelensky, and they've got their tanks, Belarusian tanks, online right on the border fueled up and ready to go, and they expect that Belarus will join this fight. At what point does this become a world war? You know, uh, all of the Western countries are pushing weapons in here, and Ukraine is trying to use them, and Ukraine actually put out a call today for any foreigners that want to help us fight this fight, come over here and we will put you on, uh, we'll put you on the rolls and give you a weapon and send you into battle. Any, but we'll take anybody that can pick up a gun right now because this is an existential threat to us. Uh, so the other thing Putin has done is he was asking, uh, I think, Kazakhstan to join, to send troops as well. I mean, look, if Putin, if this was going to plan, Putin wouldn't be asking his buddy states to be sending their forces into this, to get involved in this. And it's like he's, you know, again, he's, he's getting scared. And he's acting out of fear because, yeah, he's seeing that this is not going well. And it's not going well in the world, on the world stage. He's getting creamed with sanctions and uh, all kinds of stuff, things that he didn't expect the world to do. And, yes, yeah, so Alan says Putin will hit the red button. I don't think he's going to hit the red button. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but acting out of weakness, you will always lose. In the end, you will always lose. I believe that with all my heart, and I teach my boys, don't ever act out of comfort, fear, or pride. If you're acting out of comfort, if you're motivated by one of those three things, that's a, a Freebirmer Rangers motto, by the way. Uh, 
if you're motivated by comfort, fear, or pride, then you, you're not going to make the right decision, first of all. And your pride goes before a fall. Is Putin acting out of pride? Absolutely. Absolutely acting out of pride. Is he acting out of fear now? Yes, he is absolutely acting out of fear because he's afraid that he's going to get beaten by the Ukrainians. That's why he's asking all of his, of these other countries to come in. And, and so the other thing we're seeing is that uh, he is, uh, is it crackling. Dang it, this microphone. I'm going to get a different microphone put on here. Uh, tell you what, let's do this. We'll fix this problem right now. Okay. This will be better because this microphone has a microphone on uh, The receiver, transmitter, has a microphone on it. So I just pull this one out and I'll clip this one on and that'll be better. If you can stand that blue light, we'll be good. Okay, so um, the other thing that, that Putin did is uh, he, he's, he's been sending these giant illusion cargo planes into airfields that are not quite secure. And he's lost two of them already. These are enormous planes, huge planes. Uh, now, you wouldn't do that. You typically would not be ferrying supplies in on a giant lumbering plane the size of a hotel uh, if you weren't in trouble and your supply chain wasn't in trouble from the ground. You would think being right next door, you'd have an easy supply chain coming in, but the Ukrainians are just wearing out his tail, the, the tail of his, his campaign, and as much as they are the front. I've seen tons and tons of videos coming in from all over Ukraine today of Ukrainian civilians walking out as these tanks are rumbling through their town and standing in front of the tanks and saying, stop, stop right here. You're going to you're gonna have to run me right over. And you know what? The troops don't. They don't run them over. They stop. Because, again, the troops, they don't want to kill Ukrainians. They didn't have any plans to come here. This is Vladimir Putin's ego trip, not theirs. But they're the ones who are dying in this, and they're dying in droves now. The Ukrainian government says that they've killed uh, like 3,000 Russian troops by now. That's probably not accurate. Uh, the, there are some other kind of impartial agencies that say it's more like 500. But still, 500 troops is 500 troops in just, you know, 48 hours, 56 hours, whatever it is. Um, am I still scratchy? Dang it. I just don't know what to do with this microphone. Um, hmm, I wonder if I just need to... Re might be on this end. That fixed it. Whatever I did fixed it. Okay. Yeah, this, this microphone was causing me problems today, and I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so... Vladimir Putin is acting out of his weakness. And whenever you act out of weakness, you lose. Now, let's look at the Ukrainians. Are they acting out of comfort? Absolutely not. Men and women, old people. I saw an 80-year-old man the other day signing up, give me a rifle and I'm going to fight for my grandkids. That's unbelievable. Uh, they're not acting out of comfort. And they're not acting out of fear. They're acting in courage. Uh, obviously, they're afraid, but they're not letting that fear control them. And they're standing up to the bear and they're doing it to protect their country and their people and their way of life. And they're, they're not acting out of pride. Um, President Zelensky was willing to go and speak with the people who just invaded him to try to put a stop to this. He's on his way now to the Belarusian border to have talks and try to get this done. I say that I'm not into making predictions about the future because I'm terrible at it. I was a stockbroker for 10 years and I just wasn't very good at making predictions about the future of things. Mm. So, but if I were to make a prediction, I would say that in the end, Ukraine comes out of this on top even if they don't win the war because they have all the moral high ground. They're acting out of strength. Vladimir Putin has zero moral high ground, and he knows it, and everybody else knows it, unless he's just a madman. And he is acting out of his weakness at every step. Everything he's done is acting out of weakness. So we, I think you can take that to the bank. Now, I want to answer some of these. Uh, I've seen a couple of 
the same people who call folks like us terrorists are the ones who call Putin a dictator for not allowing drag queen. Yeah, well, okay. Oh, I wanted to also um, address something else that just keeps coming up when I'm doing interviews and stuff. And that is uh, this, I, is people keep asking me, are there bioweapons labs in Ukraine that Putin wants? Um, I, I finally, I just like, okay, I'm gonna go do some reading on this because nobody around here is talking about that. That has not been brought up one time by any Ukrainians that I've been around and um, so I'm like, what is that? What, why does this keep coming up? I went and did some research on it. It's Russian propaganda. It's Russian disinformation. And they're really good at spreading that out to a, a certain you know, element of the right wing of the, in the United States. Uh, and, and don't believe it. Uh, look, there are certainly labs in the, in the US, I mean, in, in Ukraine. There are certainly labs here of all different kinds. And some of them might even have biological, you know, media, biological stuff that's not good, you know, even maybe smallpox or something like that. Yeah, weaponized smallpox, whatever. But number one, Russia's, they might be dumb, but they're not stupid. They're not going to blow up a bioweapons lab if, they, if it's there, unless they just did it accidentally. Those things are typically not in like a shopping mall or someplace. They would be, you know, out in the woods and surrounded by security and stuff. So, and, and underground, uh, highly secure areas. So um, that's, it's, it's just funny that people keep bringing that up because I don't know, uh, for those of you who just started following me, I've got 10 books in print. Three of those books are novels. And it, they follow a special operations team and a colorless, odorless liquid explosive that is being used by terrorists. And uh, then the books in sequence track down the terror group that's using the, this new explosive. It looks like a bottle of water. The distributor who's uh, distilling out the chemical, it's a real chemical, and distilling it out and bottling it and, and selling it. And then the third book deals with the source of it and that third book takes place in Ukraine. <laughs> and it, there's a secret underground lab. I don't want to give away the whole book, but a secret underground lab that has this stuff. And the, you, you know, the, uh, there's a Ukrainian scientist who is selling it uh, on the open market. And that's where it comes from. And that's completely fictional. But now I keep getting all these people asking me about underground labs in Ukraine. And I'm like, did they read my novel and think it was a real or what? And anyway, um, so, wait, website for U.S. Embassy, what? Ukraine has their headlines. Um, I'm leaning more towards agreeing with you. The more I gather... Oh, these are going by too fast. Yeah. So, uh, so somebody says I'm giving my audience disinformation. Look, I could be wrong. Uh, I, and, and it wouldn't be the first time. And I'm not the kind of journalist that's going to pretend I'm, I'm the expert on everything. And that's why I, I keep kind of shaking my head when this issue comes up. Because, again, I'm, my job here in Kiev is to tell you what's happening here. And I can tell you that nobody here is talking about bioweapons labs on the ground. Nobody knew nothing about it. So I had to go read, read about it. What I wrote, read about it made me pretty convinced that it's Russian disinformation that's been put out. Now, I could be wrong. Uh, one of the things about the kind of people that believe things like that is that they get very, very wedded to their beliefs and get really angry if you challenge them. But I'm not one of those people. I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, send me some stuff and I'll do my best to read it and I'll change my mind. Uh, and, if, and, and, and if I break that story because, I, I'm, you know, Again, the journalists on the ground here are not doing it. Uh, then fantastic, great. Okay, uh, one last thing. Like I said, if you're the praying sort, would you pray for us? We're at a crossroads right now in our trip. We have to make a decision uh, about getting out of here. I talked about this right at the beginning about a half hour ago. Uh, we are inside the circle, inside the city of Kiev, and we're... Uh, we're, we're told that we are now entrapped by the Russians, that the Russians have us completely surrounded, uh, which is kind of what we were hoping to avoid. 
And so tomorrow we're going to try to work our way outside that circle, that line of contact. That's really dangerous thing to do. That's probably the most dangerous thing we've done so far because everybody is on edge. I'm more worried about getting shot by friendly forces than I am about getting shot by enemy forces at this point because they are very jumpy for good reason. Can't blame them. Uh, and any car that comes around the corner that they don't recognize, they're likely to shoot first and ask questions later. Yesterday, we got yanked out of the car and basically, you know, I had an AK pointed at me just like this uh, and, and, you know, pointed at my chest. And I was like, dude, 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 you know, <laughs> uh, and they searched our car and everything. Uh, not a good, not a good thing. So uh, I'm a little concerned about that, but the idea is to get outside that line of contact and to uh, set up where we can continue to report, but be outside the, the, the lines of, of attack of the Russians. You know, the Russians still only hold very small parts of Ukraine. They're sort of like a cancer that's coming in from three sides. But south and west and in the middle of the country, there's like nothing. Yes, my books are on Amazon. Just Google my name and, or, or put it into the Amazon search thing and they'll all come up, all 10 of them. And uh, I'd love for you to read those books because uh, it's a lot of work to write them. So <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for doing it. Uh, so wait, wait, what's that? Somebody else, whoops. Okay, all right, well, so much for that idea. I was trying to read what somebody wrote, but they're writing these long uh, comments and I can't read them before they flip by and the next one comes up. Um, so pray for us that we have discernment and wisdom and that, you know, we can kind of do the, these are not the droids you're looking for <laughs> um, and, and get past the Russian lines tomorrow and continue to report from here. Uh, probably will, it just depends. I mean, there's so much uh, that's going on right now. It's changing so fast. Uh, they're talking about another major offensive to try to take Kiev tonight. We're supposed to do a tour tomorrow morning that would take us right into downtown Kiev again. Uh, and so we're not even sure that's gonna happen. It just depends on whether or not the, the Ukrainians can hold the city um, by tomorrow morning. And I believe they can, I believe they can. This is gonna be a lot harder to take than Russia thinks it will. Uh, so yeah, be praying for us on that. And then uh, we have to decide which one of those five countries to go to. Right now I'm leaning toward Moldova uh, because I've never been to Moldova, and I hear it's real nice this time of year. Um, so leave in the early morning. There are multiple reports of being shot for being out uh, after curfew. Right, that's right. So we can't leave early in the morning because curfew goes till 8 a.m., and then we have this tour scheduled. So uh, we will keep you updated, I promise. Thank you for watching, everybody. Uh, I am going live uh, on Newsmax every day starting at about um, 7 a.m. at the top of the hour, uh, you know, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., uh, switching back and forth with my colleague, Sarah Williamson. Actually, she's probably on there more than I am because she's a lot better looking than I am. But uh, if you'd like to, to see the reporting we're doing, uh, make sure you tune in to Newsmax. And uh, that goes all the way until, gosh, I think we're going tonight till 10 or 11 p.m. Eastern which is insane. We're not getting a lot of sleep. Today being a Sunday, I actually got to do some, to do some laundry. I did it in the, the, the dishwasher right here in the little kitchen, kitchenette in our, uh, our little apartment we've got here. <laughs> and um, so uh, we're going to pack up and head out tomorrow. They'll be praying for us. The other issue is range. We have uh, about 600 kilometers, I figure, of range on our rental car, which we rented in Kiev and we have to return to Kiev. Uh, and it's about 600 kilometers to any of the borders where we might go. Uh, now, we don't know if we can get fuel anywhere between here and there. We have a full tank and I've got a couple extra in the back and so I calculate all the fuel we have will get us about 600 kilometers and should get us about to a border and then we're gonna have to get some gas. The other thing there's, it's impossible to find is food uh, and that's one other reason we need to leave. I don't want to be eating food that some Ukrainian needs to keep fighting the fight. Uh, and so we've got some power bars and stuff. We can la I can fast for a couple days. It's not a huge deal. Um, but it, that's another issue. And then cash. Everything is cash only right now, except for at this hotel where we're staying. 
And so we getting cash is a real difficult proposition. All the ATMs are empty. Their power is off in many places. And so it's kind of like Florida after a big hurricane, uh, except the hurricane is still coming in this case. And yeah, put a bicycle in my car. What I would probably do is just actually steal gas out of an abandoned vehicle or out of somebody's vehicle or even steal somebody's vehicle if I have to. I mean, you do what you got to do in warfare, right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, you can also follow my reporting. I'm putting a lot on my Telegram channel. You can go look up, uh, the, it's called the Hot Zone Podcast uh, Telegram channel. Go look that up. And I'm putting a lot of kind of graphic videos. I'm getting a lot of videos that I can't broadcast sent to me from soldiers and stuff out on the front lines. And so we're putting that up on Telegram. I'm uh, doing some blog posts and stuff, a lot of stuff on chuckholton.locals.com. So please go follow me there. It's been growing like crazy. Thank you for all our new supporters there. Again, that money, we're taking it out and using it to help people survive. Uh, and so thanks a lot. I appreciate all of you. That's all I got today. I'm going to hit the sack and Sarah Williamson gets all the next uh, news Max, hit, Max hits from now on. So uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thank you for all your support. God bless you all. Take care.